Hello, welcome to Sunday Night Prime. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli, a member of the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal, and it's my pleasure to be your host for today's program. Before we get into that, let me remind you that if you have any questions or comments or suggestions for programs, please send your emails to sundaynightprime at ewtn.com. That's sundaynightprime at ewtn.com. Well, you know, without doubt, one of the greatest blessings of the 20th century now into the 21st has been the great devotion to the divine mercy, Jesus revealing his uh, indescribable mercy uh, to a saint, St. Faustina, who was chosen to be his apostle and secretary of divine mercy. And she's written so many things in her diary. I know I've been reading that diary for <coughs> years now. I get so much out of it. She sort of inspires me to grow in holiness. And that's why Jesus told her, make sure you copy down everything carefully because many people are going to depend on this diary to help them grow in holiness. Well, today we're going to, we're going to take one very special aspect of that program and, uh, or of our diary. And that's why our program is entitled St. Faustina and the Holy Souls in Purgatory. And to help us talk about the holy souls in purgatory is the lady I call the purgatory <laughs> lady. And she's well known to our EWTN audience, you know, and that is Susan Tassoni. Susan, welcome. Father, it's another pleasure to be with you. <laughs> All right, very much so. And uh, Susan, we can describe her as an author, a speaker, a great guest on EWTN. Thank you. And Susan, you always have... Uh, a wonderful message for the Holy Souls in Purgatory. And uh, we want to announce that you have a new book, number nine, on books on the, on the Holy Souls, which is entitled St. Faustina Prayer Book for the Holy Souls in Purgatory. And it is a beautiful book. It's just being released, yes. you know. So what a very appropriate time. This is the Jubilee Year of Mercy. Uh, you know, we celebrate every year Divine Mercy, but this is a book you can read 365 days a year in a leap year 366. <laughs> so it's, it's a, a book for every day. And uh, you want to congratulate you on this new book and you've written many others. It's a real pleasure to, to have you on the show. It's uh, always a pleasure, you. Father. It's always good to be with a, a purgatory buster and a regional office in New York. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, let's ask that first important question, uh, you know, Susan. Why did you write this book? You've written others, you know? It was, a, it was a great honor, a great honor, Father. Um, I learned about the diary back in the 80s uh, because I like to read uh, books that are written, you know, Anne Frank's diary. The, I like to read diaries. And um, she wasn't even well known. And um, uh, I, I wasn't attached to purgatory at that time, but I was, I was probably being prepared. And then, of course, I discovered that she had a great love and tender devotion for the souls in purgatory, like any great saint. You know, Father, um, there's not one saint that uh, our Lord has not impressed upon their heart to pray for the souls in purgatory. St. Gertrude the Great, Catherine of Genoa, Padre Pio, um, the uh, Catherine of Siena, and of course, uh, uh, St. Faustina. And so that's what really drew me. And I, I learned quite a bit about um, her relationship with the souls in purgatory, what they said to her, what she did for them, and that's really what got me going. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you stop to think about the holy souls in purgatory, uh, they are what we call the church suffering. Remember, we used to divide the church into the, the faithful here on earth who are still, uh, as St. Paul would say, fighting the good fight, Fighting the right? good fight, correct. So we yeah. are the church militant. Mm -hmm. Not that we beat people up. We are fighting a spiritual battle against fallen angels and against evil in the world and so on. Right. So we are the church militant trying to win the crown 
of eternal life. Then there's the church suffering, and those are the souls in purgatory. At least they have one great consolation, despite the fact that they, they suffer, you know, and, and we'll talk about why, what their suffering mm -hmm. is like. Um, but, you know, they have one great consolation. They know they're going to heaven. They're saved, you know, yes. Their sins are forgiven, but they're making up the temporal punishment right. of their sins. They can and no then, longer offend God as well, Father. That's, isn't that beautiful, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what a day that will be when we get the relief. I, don't, I can never offend God again. I don't want to ever offend Him again, mm -hmm. you know? I should want that now, too, yeah. but yes, we do, yes. uh, we do a, you know, we, we try. Unintentionally, we hopefully. Yeah. Huh? Unintentionally. Hopefully. That's, that's right, our weaknesses and yeah. so on. And that's the mercy of God. Yes, huh? yes, yes. Just keeps yes. us going. And then, of course, there's the, the church triumphant in souls in, in heaven, mm -hmm. the glorious, uh, the glory of God, and we hope to be there someday. So, uh, so your, your great love for the holy souls, huh? Drew you and St. Faustina's great love. And her you. love, yeah. yeah. You know, Father, I, I discovered that she's the most Googled saint on the internet. Ooh. I discovered that. I discovered, too, that. Um, Catholic marketing statistics uh, said that she is uh, the most saint in demand in terms of books, in terms of um, statues, in terms of, of pictures um, in, in, by Amazon in 2014 and 2015. You know, so I'm thinking, you know, here we have her most Googled. We have her as, as um, you know, uh, the most in demand. And um, nothing was done about her relationship her insights, her revelations, her prayers about on the souls in purgatory. So this is the only book that invites us to learn about that. Um, and it also, uh, as you said, it introduces an aspect of divine mercy uh, that hasn't been too well known to us. So we're very excited to share this with the world. Yes, so very important. I know you mentioned before the saints uh, who had great love, the souls in purgatory, all of them do. Uh, but I remember particularly uh, Padre Pio, you know, being a Franciscan Capuchin, uh, um, he had that great love and he, he one time said, he said, give me all the sufferings provided that all souls are saved and all the souls in purgatory are brought to heaven. You know, and remember, Beautiful. he had great contact with them. Maybe we'll say a little bit more about that when we talk. A yes, bit later they they about visited the him as they as uh, they visited Faustina yeah. too. Yes, yeah, they would come to her and ask for that. Yes, yeah. um, I think if I saw a soul of purgatory, I'd be scared out of my wits. So what's this? That's one of my requests: is you don't need to appear to me. I scare easily. I'll help you out, but you don't have to come by. <laughs> Very good. I'm sure. I'm sure a lot of people would feel that. Put way it too. in yeah. writing for yeah, me. Put it in yeah. writing. And leave a note. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Slide it under the door. <laughs> Very good. Very good. <laughs> Susan, <laughs> now... Purgatory um, is fun, Father. It's fun. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. not, it's not a, a scary place. It's nothing to be feared. Just to know that, that it's God's love and it's his mercy um, for us. Uh, it's, a, it's a masterpiece of mercy, just as his love is. And so we, yeah. we need to be at peace with that and not to be afraid. You know, right. they're paying off a debt and they willingly suffer, Father. Yes. They, they don't want to spend one second less... Uh, out of purgatory because they're, you, they're in complete union with God. So there's no rebellion in purgatory. They choose to stay there because of the love they have for him and they are in union with him. Mm. Well, isn't their very suffering the fires of purgatory? Uh, unlike the fires of hell, the fires of hell are a fire of punishment because they have rejected God. Yes. You know, the fires of purgatory are purifying. Yes. And, and uh, they're actually created... Uh, in a sense, by this longing to be with God, you see. And uh, so it's actually love that creates the fires of purgatory, a love that it, they're yearning to have it fulfilled. It's you know? exactly. He yearns for them and they yearn for him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Beautiful. that's why we should pray because, uh, um, you know, they, they can pray. They can pray for us. I remember St. Faustina, that was one of the things she experienced. She yes. Said they were praying. They can intercede. And that's yeah. in the Catechism, Father, number 958, that the more you pray for them, the more powerful their intercession is for you. Yeah. So you could build up an army of intercessors throughout your life, sure. you know, for your family, for protection. Um, and, and in a very special way, Father, they pray for their loved ones. They pray for their, for th their salvation. Uh, they're constantly interceding for their loved ones and asking the Holy Spirit to enlighten us, to understand the malice of sin, and to help us avoid this workshop of purgatory. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's very, very important, you know. And, uh, 
And the, the strange thing is, though they pray, they cannot help themselves. And that's why we need to have uh, great concern for them and help them. They are helpless, Father, because uh, once the soul leaves the body, the eyes of the soul can't close without being in utter agony. So they're paying off a debt. Um, uh, it's, that's it. You, that's there. So they rely totally on us. We're their only deliverers. Mm -hmm. Heaven encourages us and we deliver them. Yeah. It's a great honor. It's a great privilege. And it's a duty. To pray for those mm -hmm. souls. To pray for yeah. the souls. Yeah. You know, uh, too, Father, I, I love this. That, you know, they know the guardian angels tell the souls who's praying for them. And, um, you know, they, we get some powerful benefits when we do pray for them. Uh, they become our intercessors, not only, you know, uh, during life, but even, you know, when they leave purgatory at the throne of God, they pray unceasingly. And what you have to understand is what you're giving them, Father. You're giving the souls the beatific vision, and their gratitude is in proportionate to that joy. What's the joy of being before God, this infant? I can't even imagine. And their gratitude is in proportion to that. So they're going to be pretty thankful and pretty happy to hear that you let them, you know, you let them uh, stand before God for, for all eternity. And mm -hmm. they're going to be at your side. You can count on that. Yeah, they'll be praying for, for, for us. Until when we, the end of yeah, time. That's it. That's it. So very important. Well, you know, uh, in, in your, your book, uh, you know, um, you show us how we can... Uh, follow St. Faustina and become apostles of purgatory, you know, um, her devotion, you know, touched, she touched so many souls, huh? uh, allowing the holy souls to reach heaven. Um, give us some of those examples. I know you gave us some of the, the ways that we could kind of uh, um, learn from her, you know, you had mentioned. Yes, earlier. Father, in, in the beginning of the book, uh, uh, St. Faustina Prayer Book for the Holy Souls in Purgatory, we're so excited. Um, it's breaking records. It's it's just coming out, and there's already six thousand pre-ordered. So there's a great devotion to Faustina, Father, and to the souls. So we had a, we have a great combination. But in the beginning of the book, Father, we um, talk about her revelations that she had with the souls in purgatory, and they're actually turned out to be a dozen of them. So in the beginning of the book, we call it Purgatory in the Eyes of St. Faustina, what she experienced, what they told her, what made them happy, and what they requested of her. So the first thing that they said um, in terms of what made them happy was doing the will of God. Even in purgatory, they're in complete, uh, they're in complete union with God. And they told her, is, and they're referring to us as well, is to do the will of God in all things. That way, that's what makes God happy. That's the only thing that makes God happy is us for to do his will. And it, it pleases Our Lady as well. So they, they pointed that out, uh, out to her, that that's what makes them happy. The second thing was their greatest torment, Father. She asked them what their greatest torment was, and, and you commented about that, longing for God. They saw him, they saw his glory, the love, the plan, the grace, and how we responded or not responding, um, and they suffered the loss of that, of that, uh, of that sight. Yeah. You know, one of the things, uh, uh, Susan, that uh, people don't realize, in this life, our body in some way blocks the great attraction to God. You know, it's like the soul... When the soul leaves the body, it's like God is a gigantic magnet, like a gigantic magnet. He's drawing us. Yes. But the knowledge that I have sinned, you know, I haven't, I'm not purified of my sins. I still had self-love and selfishness. That's going to keep me back from going to God. So that's why doing the will of God is uh, the way you grow in holiness. Your soul is in union with him. I remember reading recently St. Teresa of Avila. She said, don't pray for visions. She <laughs> said, you could never handle the trials that come along with visions. So don't, don't ask for them. You know, she said, just do the will of God and that will get you there. Well said, mm -hmm. Father, because in, the, in, in our book, we, she uh, comments to Faustina that it's not um, visions or revelations or um, ecstasy that's going to get you to heaven. It's the will of God. And in fact, that's the number one way to avoid purgatory is doing the will of God. And I like the way that Mother Angelica says it's in the present moment. Yeah. And that's yeah. the whole theme throughout the whole diary, Father, is the will of God. Yes, she, yes, yeah. she, she wanted, it was a little struggle for her. Well, at one point, remember when she, Jesus told us she would have to leave the order and start her own order? Remember that? That was yes, a bit of a yes, struggle. Yes, But yes. she finally, she accept, accepted that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I know there were a few more points we might want to make because we have just about a minute before our break here, yes. Susan. Yes, um, uh, they, Father, they, they told her what they needed us to do. And they needed us to, number one, have masses offered. Yeah. Uh, 
You mentioned about the Gregorian it, it masses. Is, yeah, they have masses, and then there's Gregorian masses. Put them in your will. There are 30 masses in a row for one to see soul. Um, Pious Union of St. Joseph is, is a very uh, reliable uh, uh, source to have these Gregor Gregorian masses offered. We talk about that on EWTN on many of the shows, so PUSJ.org is where you, want, uh, where you want to go. But Gregorian masses is, is very important. Um, and they also requested um, fasting was very powerful to help them. Mm -hmm. And the eternal rest prayer, Father, that one kind of, I had to figure that out. Why the eternal rest prayer? Well, it's the prayer of the church. It's the prayer that's said at wakes, when a priest come in, comes sure. in and offers prayers. It's the prayer that's said at the gravesite. And it's also an indulgence prayer, Father. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah. that was important uh, that yeah. I noted. Yeah, we always add that on to our prayers after meals, a little part, and I, I, as a priest, I always make the sign of the cross. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May they rest in peace. Amen. Uh, Susan, we're going to have to take a break. We're going to be right back. We have so much more to tell you here. We take, we're going to take three hours to do it, but we're going to have to do it in one hour. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Sunday Night Prayer. I'm Father Andrew Apostle, your host for today's program, which is entitled St. Faustina and the Holy Souls in Purgatory. And to help us along is the Purgatory Lady herself, Susan Tassoni. Susan, uh, we were talking about, you know, things that St. Faustina said were important. And we, were, we ended up on what the uh, souls in purgatory were asking of us. But what about what the Lord was asking? Oh, very good question, Father. The Lord was asking, well, Faustina had made a comment about how she talked too much and how she could say things with less words. I think we could all, we could all take, a, take a clue from that. And um, so our Lord wanted her to say short indulgence prayers for the souls in purgatory. Um, and she commented, um, she said this, we should call on Jesus for help during a conversation. There is need of much divine light at times like this in order to speak with profit for your soul and their soul. Um, she also said that, which is very powerful words, uh, that the tongue can sometimes kill father and and it can commit real murders and then it's no small thing you know every word we say is going to be you know um we judged for that exactly yeah. judged yeah. for that so uh, our lord said to say short indulgence prayers for the souls in purgatory he also told her to take time out um uh during the day for silence because if we don't the soul meaning us we're not going to be able to hear him we're not going to be able mm -hmm. to hear his voice. Um, and so um, we, should, we should do that. The other thing I wanted to mention, um, Padre Pio and Sister Faustina, both priests appeared to Padre Pio, deceased priests of his order, and the nuns appeared to um, Sister Faustina from her order, which points to the fact that these were people that she cared about, these were people that she loved, and that we too know that when, when we die, we're gonna be meeting them as well, that we're gonna be, you know, those people that we cared about are waiting for us, uh, and should, that, that should bring us consolation. Um, and so it's important to, you know, to know that, that, you know, the people that were in our life um, are waiting for us, but they need our prayers. So the nuns appeared to her that she cared about in her life, and, and the, the priest appeared to Padre Pio that he was close to in the, in the monastery. That's right, yeah. Let me read a little bit. This is from the diary. This is number 118. Just to, to kind of uh, stress what you had just said, uh, Susan. The tongue is a small member, but it does big things. A religious who does not keep silence will never attain holiness. Mm. That is, she will never become a saint. Let her not delude herself, unless it is the Spirit of God who is speaking through her. For then she must not keep silent. In other words, if it's coming from God, you have to speak. But yes, if, right. If it's not, you know, it might be just idle words and or even unkind words. Mm -hmm. But in order to hear the voice of God, one has to have silence in one's soul and to keep silence. Not a gloomy silence, but an interior silence. That is to say, 
recollection yes. in God. Huh? And that means Beautiful. for everyone, Father. You yeah. know, take some silence out during the day. You know, I have an opportunity myself, which is a, a great gift. You know, after I'm done writing, I take a break and I'm able to look at nine churches out my window. Um, and it's just it's spectacular. So uh, it, then we'll be able to hear them, um, yes. especially in adoration, Father. That's right, yeah. absolutely. See, we, in our community, we have an opportunity. Uh, once uh, a month, we're supposed to go on a day or two of silence. Uh, we call it the solitude, desert day. You know, yeah. and, and you need that. You, you need know, the that. The confusion, There's noise of the world. A lot of noise. Can yeah. really overwhelm you. And Jesus said, I can't, you can't hear me if you don't take time for silence. Mm -hmm. Then we talked about, uh, you know, or, or, you know, you mentioned in your book about the works of mercy. Yes, Father, and, you know, um, it's, uh, it's, it's the Jubilee year and this wasn't planned because, of course, during the Jubilee year, Pope Francis is asking us to take on, you know, the, the corporal and spiritual works of mercy in our lives and, in, and to pick out, pick out some and, and work on those throughout the year. Well, I learned that the corporal and spiritual works of mercy in St. Faustina's order was one of their apostolates. That's right, they were, the, they were entitled, the congregation was the Congregation of Our Lady of Mercy. Yes, exactly. Uh, so that was a surprise. Because, so what we did, Father, we took the corporal and spiritual works of mercy and we turned it into an examination of conscience. Mm -hmm. So um, so now we have something that you can use um, with St. Faustina at the end of the day uh, to kind of address those things that, you know, we, you know, mm -hmm. kind of help you in light of mercy. Have you accomplished these things and what have you done? It kind of a, like an examination. So yeah. so we're excited. It took a different twist. So to yeah. help people take it a step further. And very important. Yes, I know. I wrote a book on the works of mercy, which is entitled What to Do When Jesus is Hungry. I took that I, a title from the the gospel parable, Jesus said, I was hungry, you fed me, I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. And our judgment will be, in many ways, uh, based on that, you know, have we served Christ, have we, or have we become selfish? You know, it, it's, we need to turn away from ourselves by sharing ourselves, by sharing our resources, our, you know, blessings with others. Otherwise, we become selfish, and that excludes us from the love of Christ, and excludes us if we, you know, do not do any good, excludes us from the kingdom of heaven. It does, Father. In fact, in the beginning of the book, um, uh, she says uh, that that we're going to be judged by our mercy. Um, right. You know, so yeah. it, it, that's the, it. Remember the parable Jesus taught about the rich man and Lazarus? Yes. And the rich man, he dressed in fine clothes every day. He had sumptuous meals every day. And poor Lazarus was starving. You know, he yearned to just eat the scraps that fell from the table, you know, and Lazarus went to heaven in, in glory and happiness where the rich man was excluded because he did not see and help the poor man. You know, his heart was just turned in on himself. I remember Father Benedict said he didn't go to hell because he liked nice clothes. He didn't go to hell because he liked a nice meal. He said he went to hell because he never saw a hungry, a needy brother wow. and sister. Yeah. And Very you know, powerful. So yeah. when, um, you know, when you show mercy, mercy will be given to you. Right. Uh, and to, uh, that's something that really stuck out with me is that, you know, you're going to be judged by the mercy you gave or did not give yeah. at the end of your life. Yeah. And, you know, Susan, when people, you know, like during Lent, we always talk about prayer, fasting, almsgiving, almsgiving yeah. or works of mercy. Mm -hmm. uh, when you do these things... And particularly, you know, works of mercy, because we don't hear as much about that as the others, maybe. Um, it turns you away from self-centeredness. You really opens you up to wanting to reach out to God. Yes, it you does. Know, through it your also, brothers and sisters. It expands the heart when you show works of mercy. When yeah. you live the spiritual, when you live the sacramental life, it opens your heart to become more merciful. And that's what St. Faustina wanted, was the greatest attribute of God. She wanted his mercy. She wanted to show his mercy be a vessel of his mercy. Right. That's his greatest attribute. Yeah. And we're, we're, we're called to contemplate that. Let's hope everybody would, yeah. you know, if all, if all Catholics and Christians were those instruments of God's mercy, the whole world would be changed for the good. Yes. You know, there'd yep. yes. be peace, there'd be, uh, you know, no suffering of the poor and neglected and rejected. Yes. You know, well, we got a lot more to talk about here. You know, so, you know, you talked about uh, Saint Faustina having some, uh, in her wisdom, she had some pretty special teachers. You know, and uh, among them, who our Lord, our Lord, our Lady, our lady. Uh, mm -hmm. Saint Joseph, um, and and we have those conversations in, in the book, Father. We have a, um, 
a, a section that describes uh, special prayers that she wrote for the dying father, mm -hmm. which yep. is very, very powerful. Uh, we have a special section on adoration, uh, prayers that she, uh, that were, some of them were uh, given to her. Uh, are in the book. Um, and you know, with that dying father, uh, that's a very powerful section. Our Lord wants us to pray for the dying, uh, especially for those that are in despair. Her guardian angel told her to pray for the dying. Uh, she encourages us from, in her diary to pray for the dying. And when mm -hmm. we're praying for the dying in particular, it's the chaplet of divine mercy that they're, we're, we're being asked to pray. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, there's a section in the book too, Father, if, um, if you're not present, we quote her, if you're not present, will it help that person, you know, that's distant? And the answer is yes, yeah, it will. Sure. I have a, a, my own example. My mom was dying and, you know, she was in another state and I called home and I had my sister on the phone and we prayed the chaplet over the phone, Father. So, you know, we're praying and then there was dead silence. And I thought, my mother died. I thought God took her. And it, my sister, I, I was, my sister's name is Claudia. I said, Claudia. And, and, and I says, are you there? Did mom die? And she says, no, no. She was all shaken. The room was filled with incense, she said. No. Yeah. And, and I understand that that's uh, symbolic of God's presence. So he, it is odor true. Odor of sanctity. Yeah. That's what uh, it's called. Oh, is it? The odor yeah. of sanctity. She, yeah. she, there was nothing in the house. There was no roses, no flowers. And it shook her up. It really did. But she mm -hmm. said there was a strong scent of incense. There while was we were a pregnant. sister who died in a convent in New Jersey. And she had been in the infirmary. After she died for five days, that infirmary had that odor it, of sanctity. Oh. Yes. And it exhumed her body like 20 years later. She was completely intact, and the body gave off that odor of sanctity. Beautiful. Beautiful smell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sign from God. And not everybody gets that. Yeah, but, uh, it, was a, it yeah. was a gift to, you know, to us. I know I, before the show we had talked, uh, Susan, about um, where, where does it say that Jesus speaks to souls that are dying? Important and question, is, yes. Yeah, I know you've told me you get this question a lot from mm -hmm. people. Well, if you want to check the diary, I would suggest looking at numbers 1485 mm -hmm. and 1486. In 1485, you have a conversation between, you know, the merciful God with a sinful soul. And Jesus is speaking to this soul, encouraging them, you know, and they're tempted to think that their soul, their sins will keep them back. In fact, the soul answers Jesus after he's been so inviting to the, his mercy. He says, Lord, I hear your voice calling me to turn back but uh, from the path of sin. But I have neither the strength nor the courage to do so. Jesus keeps calling. And the soul says again, I recognize your holiness and I fear you. Jesus calls again. You know, Lord, uh, Lord, I doubt that you will pardon my numerous sins. My misery fills me with fright. And finally, Jesus hits with a powerful grace, you know, final call. And the soul says, you have conquered, O Lord, my stony heart with your goodness. In trust and humility, I approach the tribunal of your mercy. Beautiful. And see, when we pray, we're praying for those souls to respond to Jesus. Isn't that a beautiful yes, idea? yes. He, yeah. Jesus actually encouraged Faustina to say that chaplet for, for that very reason, for those yeah. souls. And you know, the next thing that happens there, 1486, I mentioned that, that's Jesus speaking to a despairing soul. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, a soul that given up all hope and he draws that. So he said, even if the soul made the slightest turn to my mercy, I will draw them. Beautiful. But if they reject his many calls, he said, I have to leave them in that state. Mm. And they will be in that state forever, you know, rejecting God and uh, despairing yeah. of his mercy. So we need to, uh, the guardian angel encouraged Faustina to pray um, for the dying. Mm -hmm. Jesus encouraged her to pray for the dying. Faustina encourages us to pray for the dying. So the best way we pray for the dying is the chaplet of divine mercy. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. We encourage you every day. Pray that every day. Uh, that's one thing that it impacted me when I was writing the book is uh, mm -hmm. the, the power of that that mm -hmm. chaplet, Father. Yeah. You know, you had some beautiful things uh, to say about the guardian angels. Huh? Yes, we talked about you know um, they they led her to, they led her to purgatory, and then of course encouraged her to pray for the dying. So they do more than just provide transportation, Father, <laughs> to purgatory. You know, um, they inform uh, the the souls in purgatory uh, who who is praying for them, and then right. the, the souls then continue will pray for them. They inspire us. To, um, to pray for them. And, you know, when you get a name or something, somebody pops into your head, that's your guardian angel. 
you sure, know, encouraging maybe, you to maybe, pray. Yeah. So they encourage, uh, they inform, and they inspire us. And they console too. They console. Those yes, souls they console. There. Yeah, they're there nice. with that soul, Father, from mm -hmm. the moment of, of confession, com conception until they're with you for all eternity, except for uh, only one who rejects. Only one who rejects is when they depart. If you reject God, they depart from you. That's the only time. Mm -hmm. You speak about them as pretty special buddies. <laughs> they're pretty, but yeah, I call them special buddies. They're some good buddies. <laughs> so we need the wisdom devotion. from Our Lady, Our Lord, yeah. and mm -hmm. Saint Joseph, mm -hmm. and we've got our our special buddies. Yeah. Well, you know what? You're mentioning Our Lady, uh, Susan, but we're going to have to take a break now. I don't want to get into that because it's so beautiful. You know, don't leave us. We've got some beautiful things to share. You know, if you've been inspired so far, which I, I'm sure this is inspiring, uh, we'll be right back with some wonderful things to share with you. <laughs> Welcome back to Sunday Night Club. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli, your host for today's program, which is entitled St. Faustina and the Holy Souls in Purgatory. And to help us really get to the heart of this message, we've got the Purgatory Lady. I always say, she's, it's Susan Tassoni. She's well known on EWTN, but I always say to Susan, you know more about purgatory <laughs> than any person I know except somebody who's been there. So I don't know anybody who's been there who's come back to talk to me. Well, we're a team, but, Father. That's right. But you know so much in sharing, you know, your wonderful love for the Holy Souls and for St. Faustina. You know, what part did Our Lady play in her life? Oh, very huh? important part. You know, stay close to Mama, as I say. Um, she had a very intimate and tender relationship uh, with Our Lady. And, and this is what she said. She said that to love Jesus, we must have a sincere love for his mother. Our Lord told her, pray with all your heart in union with Mary. And, and she said that the more I, t I imitate the mother of God, the more deeply I get to know God. So we really need to stay close to the Blessed Mother to fulfill the will of God. Mm -hmm. She fulfilled it so perfectly, didn't she? She did. She called herself the handmaid of the Lord, yes. which meant she was ready to do whatever God wanted. And then if God wanted her to conceive this son, she gave consent, let it be done to me according to your word. That was the most perfect response of a human being to God's will. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Only Jesus, of course, in his humanity would have done more, but he was also a son of God, you know. But Mary, that consent of Mary opened the way for the incarnation to take place. Yeah. You know? Beautiful Father. Yeah. Yeah. So she's our powerful intercessor for us. Don't let also, go of her hand. That's right. <laughs> Which that's, is the rosary, I say. Don't let go of that rosary. That's right. Yes. That's her. Uh, prayer. She always requests, you know, the, the one thing, remember that, the one thing she asked for in all six of her apparitions mm -hmm. at Fatima, pray, tell the people to pray the rosary every, every day. day. Please say your rosary every day for peace in the world, the conversion of sinners, and the freedom of the souls in purgatory. A absolutely. Why? Because of the indulgence that's attached to the, to the rosary too, Father. Mm -hmm. And what was that beautiful title the souls in purgatory gave her? Oh, they gave her the star, they call her the star of the sea, Father. And mm -hmm. you great, gave me great light uh, that's included in the book um, on what that meant. So I'm going to let you share that. Uh, but that's okay. in our book. Yeah. Why see, was she called Star of the Sea? See, in ancient times, the, the, the sailors, when they were out in the middle of the ocean or the Mediterranean, you know, uh, I mean, they couldn't see any signs. They didn't have the kind of communication we have now. They had to guide themselves by a star that was outstanding. And that was called the North Star or Polaris. And uh, that was known as the Star of the Sea. It guided them. Mm -hmm. There was a fixed a point fixed up star. there yeah. to guide them to where they were going to mm -hmm. find land. Well, Mary guides us. Right. You know, you mentioned he, you mentioned in your book that the the souls in purgatory called her the steering star. Yeah, yeah. steering star, which yes. is again she steers us to her son. Yep, yeah. that's right. And um, and so we have to uh, we have to go with Mary and. Uh, Imitate Mary. Now, she's also talked about the, her favorite virtues. Her Mary favorite virtues. And, and you know, Father, um, the Star of the Sea is one of her titles, too. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, right. Star in of the, the Litany. Sea. Mm -hmm. In the Litany, exactly. That's right. um, she told Faustina, um, and again, throughout this, this new book, 
all these things that we're sharing about, uh, the, you know, how Faustina became holy, what mm -hmm. her favorite devotions were, you know, what the, what the Holy Souls needed, all line up with how to avoid purgatory and how to help the souls in purgatory with the help of Faustina. Our Lady told her that there were three dearest virtues that were, uh, virtues that were dearest to her and to God. And they were humility, 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 purity, and love of God. Mm -hmm. um, and that we are to radiate these virtues throughout life. Um, I noticed that word radiate came up many times throughout me reading and researching. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so she's calling us to radiate these virtues. And to give you an example of humility, I wanted to share this with you, Father. Um, uh, Cardinal uh, Mary Duval was, a, was the private secretary to Pius X. And uh, he was offering mass one day and discovered that there was no altar boy. And he wasn't sure what happened, so he continued to get ready. He turns around, and there is Pius X kneeling at the foot of the altar in the garb of an altar boy. And he told him, from this point on, I am going to um, uh, serve your mass. And he said, uh, the motto of, of altar boys is to reign, uh, to reign is to serve. So I thought that was a beautiful lesson on humility. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes, and uh, of course, that's what we all have to be. Humility, really, uh, it's a misunderstood virtue by many. They think, uh, well, you make yourself like a little worm or you, you put yourself down, a doormat. No, no, no. Humility means the truth about myself. And who tells me who I am? God tells me. See, humility is who I am before God. That's what it is. There's nothing groveling in dirt or anything mm -hmm. like that. You know, sometimes you read the, some of those accounts of saints who did some exotic things, uh, you know. Uh, no, it simply means to be truthful about myself. And you know, unfortunately, Susan, today, a lot of people forget they were created by God. Yes. That's, right. that's the basis of all humility. I'm not my own God. I didn't make myself. I don't have an, an entitlement to everything. I have an, do you know what I have a right to? To do God's will. To do God's will, that's it. That's right, He created me. See? That's right. But so many yeah. people want to do their own will. They think they got a right to that, and as if they created themselves. But, you know, St. Paul says, none of us lives as our own master. Mm -hmm. None of us dies as our own master. Mm -hmm. In life, we belong to the Lord, and wow. when we die, we die as His Beautiful servants. Father. So either we're, we want to use the image of servant. Jesus said, I'm in your midst as one who serves. You know, the Pope said he's the servant of the servants of God. Or use the image of Our Lady. You know, for the mm -hmm, women, mm -hmm. be the handmaid of the Lord, like Mary, ready to serve. And that's why such great things happen. It's Beautiful. Humility. humility uh, then there was uh, purity. Um, we have to radiate purity. And perfect example was Faustina. She was pure in mind, body, and soul. I, I like to also, uh, she forgave, um, which is... Uh, M Maria. Uh, Marie yeah. Gretti forgave. Um, Faustina had to do a lot of forgiving. She was talking about living in a community isn't that easy. You know, you're not living with angels. Um, and, uh, uh, but, but, but they both forgave. In fact, Maria Gretti forgave Alessandro. Um, and she was also concerned that he, you know, that he was committing a mortal sin. She was concerned about his soul. That's right. And I learned, Father, when the relics came uh, to, to Chicago, the rector said that because of that one act of forgiveness, that set in motion um, the uh, ability for, for God gave him the grace of repentance right? Uh, because of that one act. I mm -hmm. think there was something um, about uh, forgiveness, Father, that you had. I think it's number 1148 about forgiveness mm -hmm. in, in the diary. It, I think it's even better reading it. What, um, what God, uh, how God treats us when we forgive. Mm -hmm. Let me take it here. 1148. Okay. We resemble God most when we forgive our neighbors. God is love, goodness, and mercy. And here's what Jesus said. Every soul, and especially the soul of every religious, should reflect my mercy. My heart overflows with compassion and mercy for all. The heart of my beloved must resemble mine. In other words, those who are beloved by Jesus. I mean, you know, uh, they must resemble Jesus' heart. From her heart must spring the fountain of my mercy for souls. Otherwise, I will not acknowledge mm -hmm. her as mine. Right. So, you know, remember Jesus even said in the gospel, when you bring in a gift and you remember you have something against your brother or mm -hmm. sister, you leave the gift and be reconciled. Right. And we mm -hmm. resemble God the most when we forgive. And you, uh, God bestows many graces on you when, when you forgive. That's uh, right. So, so important. Very, yeah. very important. Uh, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so uh, that's an example of, of purity. And um, 
we must radiate that in love of God. What pleases, uh, what pleases Our Lady most is carrying out the will of God. As you said, nothing pleases God more. And an example of love of God, Jesus told Faustina that this is unquestionable proof of God's love, which is practice mercy by deed, by word or prayer. You want to know if you love God, you want unquestionable proof of love of God, then practice mercy by deed, by word or prayer. In fact, I, she said, Faustina said, mercy is Satan's greatest torment. Right. He hates when we show mercy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. I was reading that the other day in the, in the diary. You know, he, Satan was so angry because she was talking about God's mercy and how we had to be merciful in our lives. See, Beautiful. see we received the gift of mercy from God, all mm -hmm. his goodness and love. Throughout life, but, yeah. I, I and then, you says yeah. this. And then we share it with others. Very, yeah. so, well, oh, beautiful Father. Yeah. Um, God never violates our free will. Uh, Our Lady demands prayer. Uh, she said that we need to, she told Faustina to pray for the world. She told Faustina to pray for her country and to offer nine masses in Holy Communion an atonement for her country. I think we should do that, an atonement for our country. Um, Faustina said that we need to arm ourselves in prayer for all kinds of combat, no matter what age, and we need perseverance in prayer, and that our salvation often depends on much difficult prayer. That's right. Persevere. Persevere in prayer. Um, don't become discouraged if you don't get an answer the way you think it should come right away. God is testing your trust in oh, Him. Oh, well said. We also can, uh, prayer is one of the ways she said that we can discern the will of God. And she shared that in order to discern God's will, we can ask these three questions. Is it for the glory of God, for the good of my own soul, or for the good of other souls? Those are right. very helpful questions. Sure, sure, yeah. The glory of God should be the, the aim of our life and everything we do. Beautiful. You yeah. know? Uh, after all, uh, we owe him. He's all good and he's worthy of all yeah. our love. Huh? At the same time, I should pray also for the good of my own soul. Don't forget to, say, to do that. You know, there's a lot of people who say, well, I never pray for myself because it's selfish. You better pray for yourself because yeah. we have to, you know, we have to get to heaven. That's why Jesus taught us his beautiful prayer, the Lord's Prayer. We yeah. have to pray have, for our have needs. masses offered for yeah. yourself. Then you also pray for others. That's important right, too. Right, exactly. You know? So there, you love, you love God with all your heart and soul, but you love yourself, you love your neighbor as you love yourself. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. there's three, degree, three kinds of prayer, for God's glory, for our good, and the good of our brothers and sisters. Yeah. Beautiful. Very beautiful. Okay. Beautiful. Um, there was a, a, a question that was asked me uh, that we have in the book is how did she become holy? And how do we become holy? Um, the point is, is you know, it's, uh, it's not... Um, uh, not holiness doesn't consist of I think you mentioned this raptures or or apparitions um, or gifts or graces um, to become holy is uniting your will with the will of God. So how did she become holy? She um, actually God gave her light on on his greatest attributes. And she uh, she said that these are the greatest attributes of God. The first is his holiness. And, you know, it's interesting. These attributes, um, you know, help you understand, you know, how, how important it is to, to become holy. Um, she said that holiness is so great that all the powers and virtues tremble before him. The pure spirits veil their face and lose themselves in unending adoration. And with one single word, they express the highest form of adoration that is holy, holy, holy. You have to be holy to stand before God. You have to be holy to enter heaven. Absolutely. A lot of people think that, well, they were holy. Uh, but, you know, look what she's saying. The ver all powers and virtues tremble before him, which are the, the, the angels, mm -hmm. because of his holiness. Yeah, we would not. That's why you need purgatory. Yes, you know, yeah. uh, Someone said if, if purgatory didn't exist, we'd have to create it. That was it Benedict, Pope Benedict. We, we would not ever want to be in the presence of an all-holy, infinitely holy God if we had even the slightest self-love left in our mm -hmm, soul, we mm -hmm. have to be purified exactly. of everything. Then we could be filled with God's love. Yeah. See, we can't be filled if we, if we still got self-love there. Right. Selfishness. So, so holiness is one of his greatest attributes. The next mm -hmm. greatest, or not the next one, the uh, second greatest, or, the, well, there's holiness, justice. His justice is so great and penetrating that it reaches into the heart of things and all things stand before him in naked truth and nothing can withstand him. Yes, that's why we have to be honest with ourselves. Mm -hmm. you know? A lot of people today, unfortunately, they don't want to know what their faults are, their sins. They, you know, everybody He's, does these things. You know, they rationalize. And, but it's when the truth penetrates, 
we see ourselves as God sees us. Right. And that's where we're getting ready for heaven. Right. He's all holy. He's all just. Mm -hmm. And the greatest attribute of all is his love and mercy. And of course, that's made known through the incarnation. And he told our uh, Faustina to meditate on these attributes. She even wrote prayers for each of these attributes. Um, and she wanted the greatest attribute. She wanted to reflect the greatest attribute, which was his mercy. Um, she wanted to be a vessel of his mercy. Now, he didn't infuse that in her. She uh, was accepted into the, I say, the school of mercy by God. How did she become merciful? Father, it was, I, I thought it was something grand and and probably might be difficult to, uh, to do, but no, she prayed, she adoration, the sacraments, confession, forgiveness, um, reading scripture, a strong prayer life. That's how she grew step by step, and that expanded her heart to become more merciful, and that's how we can become holy and mm -hmm. merciful, because practicing mercy saves those who show mercy. That's right. And with the holy souls, how does that tie in? Well, we need to frequent the sacraments, to help the souls, we need to say the rosary, we need to do the chaplet, we need to do the raise, way of the cross. The same school of mercy that she entered to be merciful is the same thing that applies to help the souls out of purgatory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, and that's what helps us grow in holiness do, because doing the will of God will move us to do all of these things, mass, going to mass, going to confession, you know, recognizing our need for the sacraments, the Eucharist, and so on, you know, and then growing in our prayer life, right? Exactly, uh, and step the, the by rosary. step. Yeah, you grow in wisdom, and you grow in the reality of God's mercy. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned uh, also the way of the cross. Oh yes, Father, I learned it was her favorite devotion, and we have a we have the way of the cross for the Holy Souls in Purgatory that I uh, had the honor to give to to John Paul, and it's very popular. It's really said uh, during Lent, it's a very popular season of the year, but she loved the way of the cross. And um, uh, it's actually one of the, again, uh, devotions that her order encouraged, but this was her favorite. Um, and I have a Pope story when, um, a true story about, uh, there was a nun on duty at a mother house and she was doing a final check and there was a visiting bishop. And uh, she realized that she heard some noises and there was nobody in the choir, there was nobody in the pews, but she saw this bishop on his knees, Father, crawling from station to station. Uh, she left the lights on, pulled back. The next day, she brought that story to recreation, not knowing that this was going to be St. John Paul II. He had a great love for the, soul, uh, for the souls in purgatory, I, I learned. He had a great love for the Stations of the Cross. And this man of simple piety took the suffering of his own personal life, the suffering of his people, the suffering uh, you know, of his time, personal suffering, hardships, and he summed it up by praying the Stations of the Cross. Yeah. Remember when they asked him why he didn't step down when he had that, uh, what did he suffer from? Uh, Parkinson's. Parkinson's, yeah. yeah. Um, he said, Jesus didn't come down from the oh, cross. Oh, I remember. Yes, beautiful. What a powerful statement, huh? Yeah. Mother you Angelica know, said, Father, too, that you become more compassionate when you pray the Stations of the Cross. Sure. And you also, again, because of your show, I watch you Every Sunday, you gave this great quote from St. Leonard of Port Maurice on the benefits of praying yeah. the stations, and that is now in, in our book. Thanks to That's you, there. Father. Okay, Thanks yeah. to you. Yeah, he said this is um, what salutary insights will the continual meditation on the bitter passion of the Son of God stir up in the soul. Daily experience has taught me that by this devout form of prayer, men's lives are quickly changed for the better. Yes, for the better. You're walking with the Jesus. You know who was the first one to make stations of the cross? Our Lady. Our Lady. Mm -hmm. After the resurrection, mm -hmm. you know, the ascension, Jesus, uh, Mary went along the way of the, uh, mm -hmm. the cross where she had been with Jesus. Right, yeah. Well, you know what? I know we wanted to get to some concluding remarks that you wanted to make. Yeah. Uh, could you? Some discoveries, uh, Father, about purgatory. Yeah. Uh, Okay. I, I, I had uh, two discoveries, Father. Um, one that it's gluten-free, Father. Purgatory is gluten-free. <laughs> no, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Um, actually, there are no wallets in Purgatory, Father. You, you, you can't take no. it with you. But on a personal... No, what? No, what? no wallets. Well, there no, no wallets. Okay, no, yeah. You yeah, can't yeah. take it with you, Father. No, but, no, nothing. But, um, but yes, this is what I learned. It, I, it was, she, uh, here's one of my favorite quotes in the book. Um, it, I learned about, she taught me much more about God's infinite love for us and the depth of his mercy. Here's one of my favorite. When I, this is what she said to Jesus. When I received Holy Communion, I said to him, Jesus, I thought about you so many times last night. And Jesus answered me. And I thought of you before I called you into being. Jesus, in what way were you thinking about me? In terms of admitting you to my eternal happiness. He was thinking about 
you being with him for all eternity. And he said, uh, he said to Faustina, if I create creatures into being, if I do, that's the abyss of my mercy. You know, Father, he could have called anyone into being, but he sure. picked you, he picked me, he picked all our listeners. It's a tremendous grace to be born. He right. doesn't need us, he's self-sufficient, but because mm -hmm. we're made in his image and likeness, we have this spark of him in us and he can't live without us. That's so right. he never had to create you or me or That's anybody, right. never. But out of the millions of beings, he created us and he, he left everybody else in, into nothingness. So mm -hmm. he could have gotten somebody that was much holier or smarter or more interesting than you or I, mm -hmm. but he didn't create them. There was something about you and me and everybody that's listening that attracted him to you. Yes. And this draws, th that's why he created us, and this is our faith. And I know Catherine Siena said something too about that. Right, she said, God the Father, you, she prayed to him, you absolutely do not need us, but you act as if you cannot get along <laughs> without us. Isn't that great? The, the, the well, love, you know, yes. ahead, it, the, the love, I can't, it's hard to get my head around, but this is, this is, he created us. Yeah. He didn't have to. This is his mercy, so, you know. His, his, you know how, see, what a gift. See, when he absolutely created us in the beginning, it was absolutely pure love. Yeah. He had no need for us. Right. But he did it out of pure love. When we fell through original sin and personal sin, then he had to be just. But he redeemed us right. through mercy. So mercy is given. Yes. Is love given to someone maybe unworthy of Yes. Well, Susan, we have so much more that we could say, but we can't say it now. We're going to have to end our program. But it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show. Thank the you, Purgatory Father. lady. Great honor. And I hope and pray that you've inspired so many. Let us pray. We pray for the souls in purgatory. Lord Jesus, grant eternal rest to all the faithful departed, especially all of our loved ones, all of those who are uh, most in need of your mercy, maybe forgotten souls, we want to pray. And so we say, eternal rest grant Friends unto them, them, O Lord, Lord and let perpetual light, light shine upon, upon them. them. May, May they rest soul. in peace. Amen. May the souls of the faithful departed, to the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. And I bless all of you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God love you now. Amen. Well, we come to that part in the program now, Susan, where we make our appeal for uh, the support of EWTN. What a lesson on divine mercy, on the souls in purgatory, and many of those people we know, and someday we're going to be among them probably. I don't know, unless you do a great job to get, you know, to bypass that, you'd have to be doing God's will every moment, you know. Uh, but um, uh, we should strive for that, of course. But we need to get this message out always. And there's so many messages that EWTN is giving in a world that has so much confusion and lack of God. Please help EWTN to keep going by your prayers and be as generous as you can in supporting them. God will bless you. And I know those souls in purgatory will pray for you also. So God love you. <laughs>